Thank you, Pastor Gary. Can we give Jesus some praise this morning? Amen. Well, I'm excited, very humbled to bring the word this morning. And I believe that the word of God is powerful. Do you believe that? Are your hearts open this morning? Yes. You expectant that God is going to speak a word to you, a scripture, a sentence, whatever it is he wants to speak this morning in this place. And um, recently we have been doing a series called Build This House. And last week, Pastor Danny brought a brilliant message about being a house of worship. And today is going to be like a part two of that. Is that okay? Awesome. You see, I'm a youth pastor, so I'm not used to quiet rooms. So you can preach back at me. You can talk to me this morning. I just want to know that I have some friends and family out there. Are you guys out there this morning? (laughs) Awesome. All right. Well, if you are looking for a title, it is this, the soundtrack of our lives. The soundtrack of our lives. Have you ever been caught singing? Anybody? (laughs) Have you ever been caught singing in the car? Yep, like you're driving, you have your favorite CD on, you have your playlist on, and you pull up to the traffic light and someone's just seen you belt out your favorite tune. Or maybe the song comes on and it's raining and it gets all dramatic and you feel like you're in a music video clip. Anyone done that before? You just sing out the window. (laughs) Have you ever been overheard singing in the shower? Anybody a shower singer in this place? I see those hands. Yep, you belted out in the shower. What about in your room? You ever been caught singing in your room? You know, when I was younger, I used to like dance in front of my mirror and then my mom would walk in and be like, I'm not doing that. (laughs) Have you ever been caught singing? You see, this morning we are talking about the soundtrack of our lives. And if your life had a soundtrack, there would be a song for every single defining moment. <clears throat> I've been away this weekend with grades six to eight, so my voice may leave me and that's okay. <laughs> we did a lot of singing, we did a lot of karaoke. But if your life had a soundtrack, <laughs> there would be a song for every defining, memorable moment. So this morning I wanna ask you, If your life had a soundtrack, what would the songs be on that soundtrack? And this morning, I want to share one memory and one song with you. Is that okay? All right, so as Pastor Gary said, my husband is from Windsor. He grew up here, and we met in Sydney, Australia, which is where I grew up, and we did Bible college together. But we actually met serving at youth on a Friday night. So good things happen in youth ministry, am I right? (laughs) And so as Paul was pursuing me, he would kind of find like excuses and reasons to text me. And you see something about Paul, he um, is an incredible musician, he loves music, and he just had like these cool, vibey playlists. He loved discovering new music. So he'd send me a song and be like, I discovered this, you know, do you like it? And I was like, that's a great song. And so when we started to date, music just became a part of our story, and it was something we loved, something we bonded over. And so we would have songs that would connect us to defining memorable moments in our dating relationship. And when it came to our first year of dating, Paul gave me a gift. Does anyone like gifts in this place? Yes, just nudge the person next to you, look across the room, yep. (laughs) And so Paul gave me a gift, and I have it here with me this morning, and it is a cassette tape player. Does anyone remember these? Any people in the house remember these this morning? I was like, what do I do with it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, And so he gave this to me, and I was so excited. And um, you have to put headphones into this one. And as I listened to it, Paul had recorded songs that were connected to defining memorable moments in our dating relationship. So like the song we listened to on the way to the night when he asked me to be his girlfriend. And it was so romantic. And in between each snippet of song, he'd talk about the memory and connect the song and the memory. But you see, at the very end of the recordings on this cassette tape player, there was a song I didn't know. I was like, what song is this? 
And to my surprise, Paul had written me a song and he'd recorded the song on the cassette tape player. And so this morning, we're going to hear a snippet of this song. Does anybody want to hear it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I would never do that to Paul. In the first service, he looked at me and it was like all the life was drained out of him. He's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? We'll save that for another sermon. But (laughs) if I was to have a soundtrack to my life, some of the songs would be found on this cassette tape player. If you were to have a soundtrack to your life, what would some of the defining songs be on there? You know, this morning we're going to head into the Bible and we're going to read in Acts this story about Paul and Silas. And it's when they are caught singing in a defining moment for them. And so we're going to pick it up in Acts. I love you, youth ministry. See, we do this thing in youth because we get excited about the Word of God. We love the Word of God. And so when I say Acts, you go, oh, Acts 16, verse 16 to 34. They did great, guys. Can you give it up for the youth ministry? (laughs) We'll follow along in this story. And it says this, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. And she followed Paul and Silas and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. And finally, I like Paul. Finally, Paul became so annoyed (laughs) that he turned around and he said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Verse 22, the crowd, sorry, verse 19, when the owners realized their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. And they brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and they are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. And then the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And after that, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Verse 24, when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. This is the verse I want you to catch this morning. It's verse 25. It says, about midnight. Everybody say midnight. Midnight. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and he rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? How incredible. And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his household were baptized. And then the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household household. What an incredible story, right? What an incredible story. It leads me to my first point this morning, and it is this. Our place or position in life does not determine our praise. Amen? Our place or position in life does not determine our praise. Can we just talk about their location for a moment? They are in a prison, in chains, in um, cuffs, in stocks. And it says that they were awake at the midnight hour. And it's not that unusual that they were awake at the midnight hour because it would have been so uncomfortable that they would have had to have slept in either a sitting up position 
or lying down on the cold floor. And moving was almost impossible. You would just cramp because the stocks were so fast to their feet. And I like to imagine as I read my Bible, and I just imagine the prison. Dark, cold, sorrowful. And then hope begins to rise. Peace begins to rise. Faith begins to rise because at about midnight, Paul and Silas start to sing praises to God. And I think maybe if I was in that moment, I don't know what I would have been singing. I might have been singing, God, this sucks. (laughs) You've abandoned me. I'm in prison. And I don't know what him Paul and Silas were singing, but I kind of like to think maybe it's there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Maybe it's that our God can never fail, that there's no stronghold that he can't break, no life that he can't save. Our God never fails. And I wonder if we would have found ourselves singing praises to God in that moment or responding with bitterness. You know, whatever the song was, whatever it was, in one of Paul and Silas's lowest moments, they chose to praise the name of Jesus. In their moment of humiliation, as they were wrongly accused, they chose to praise the name of Jesus. In a dark and sorrowful and cold prison, they chose to praise the name of Jesus. This is radical. This is faith that their circumstances didn't inform their praise, but rather their faith informed their praise to Jesus. And you're like, well, Sarah, I'm doing my best to follow Jesus. I'm trying to be a light in my workplace. I'm I'm trying to build a healthy family, but I'm, I'm coming up against these things. I'm dealing with this on the inside. I'm dealing with this internally, and I'm trying to follow Jesus. And I just want to say, You're in good company this morning. Paul and Silas, they were doing the work of God. They were seeing demons cast out, miracles happening, preaching the word of God, and yet they still found themselves in an uncomfortable place. And uncomfortable places in life does not mean that God has abandoned us. We were not created for comfort. We were created for the praise and glory of his name. Amen? In in uncomfortable places, we can find comfort in his presence. I truly believe that. And so for some of you this morning, I pray that this would be an encouraging word, that God has not abandoned you, that no matter what place or position you find yourself in in life, that you would choose to make um, worship the soundtrack of your life. You know, Jesus says it like this in John. Oh, in John 16, verse 33, you you guys can get involved. It says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. That is good news this morning. And so we're presented with an opportunity (laughs) Will we praise Jesus when we're in the prison or just when we're in the palace? (laughs) Will we praise Jesus on the mountaintops of life or also in the valleys? Will we choose to praise Jesus no matter our place or position in life? And I'm telling you that praise changes the atmosphere of your life. Praise brings gratitude Praise displaces fear. Praise magnifies Jesus. Praise causes faith to rise. We are called to be the people of his praises. We are called to make praise the soundtrack of our lives. And something that I've learned about praise and about worship is that God doesn't need my worship. Like he's not this egotistical God in heaven being like, you better worship me. God is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy to be praised. Amen? 
He is worthy of our worship. He doesn't need my worship, but man, is he worthy of my worship and I'm created to worship him. And so are you. So this morning in Psalm 24, 8 to 10, (laughs) is it okay to have fun in church? Is that okay? Amazing. (laughs) It says, who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he? This king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Psalm 151 to 6. I'm going to read it all together as it comes up on the screen in just a moment. It starts with praise the Lord, and we're going to follow along together. So praise the Lord. You guys can say it along with me. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tremble and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we give him some praise in this place this morning? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Not just praise on a Sunday, although I love this and I'm passionate about this, but praise on a Monday when you go to work. When you enter into your school, into your university, when you're at home with your kids, loving and raising them, praise the Lord on a Tuesday. Praise the Lord on a Wednesday. Praise the Lord on a random Thursday night. You know, I had a random Thursday night last year in December, and I got a call. I was at work. I got a call from two of my dear friends who inspired me, and they were in the hospital, and they'd gotten some what seemed like bad news. And to be honest, it just couldn't have been what seemed like worse timing for them in the natural. And so I left everything at work just to go and be with them in this moment of need. And as we left the hospital that day, to be honest, we left with more questions than answers. And that night, we were actually meant to be celebrating one of their birthdays because it was their birthday the next day. And we were um, having people come over to Paul and I's place. And I said, hey, we're meant to have people over tonight, but do you just want me to call everyone and I can cancel it? Do what you need to do tonight. And I was so inspired by them. They said, no, you know what? Tell everyone to come over and tell them to come ready to just worship and pray. We just want to worship and pray tonight. It's like, okay. So everyone came over to Paul and I's little granny flat in Sydney. <laughs> and we squished everyone inside. And we had a piano that was free from Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> and a bit of a dingy acoustic guitar. <laughs> and in that place, prayers and worship started to rise. In the middle of one of their lowest moments, in the middle of their questions and the confusion, they chose to praise Jesus. And I was sitting on the floor, (laughs) there's not much room in there, there's only so many seats. And so I was sitting on the floor, just singing along, praising and worshiping, and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me in that moment and said, this, this is the kind of worship that pleases me. This is the kind of faith that pleases me. Not just faith and worship on a Sunday, but faith on a Thursday when life happens. Would we praise the Lord? I want to prophetically say, as we come into November and December, the end of this year, as we look to the year ahead, maybe you're excited, maybe you're scared, maybe you're uncertain, But I want to say, would we prophetically send praise ahead of us as we enter into 2024? Would we enter in praising the name of Jesus, full of hope, that we would praise his name because there is power in our praise? That leads me to my second point, that there is power in our praise. 
And I pray that Parkwood Church would be known for its passionate praise to Jesus. And you see three signs and wonders. As we read through this story, there are three signs and wonders that follow as Paul and Silas choose to praise God in one of their lowest moments. And the first one is this. It's that people received salvation in Jesus Christ. And this one gets me excited. Come on, people were saved. People were saved. You find that in Acts 16, 27 and 34. You see, once they started singing, their chains were completely broken, and they were free to run. (laughs) They were free to go. I would have been like, God did the miracle. Let's go. I'm out of here. The miraculous release has happened. But as we read the story, we see that they stayed in the cell, and I think it's because they knew that an even greater miracle was about to happen. You see, the prisoner, um, the prison guard jolts up awake and freaks out because his responsibility is to look after these prisoners. And if he didn't, he would have been executed. That was the punishment. And so he's freaking out. But I love that Paul and Silas stay. And then you see this story just goes from zero to a hundred real quick. And before you know it, he's like, tell me about this Jesus. Tell me how I can be saved. He's taking them back to their house. He's washing their wounds. He's feeding them a meal. He's getting baptized. Like it's a new life Sunday in this place. Like it's prison ministry. Things are going from zero to a hundred. And he is saved, not just him, but his whole household. And their freedom resulted in the jailer's freedom. Paul and Silas's miraculous release did not just lead to their escape from prison, but rather to the jailer's conversion, his own release from sin and death. This is so wild to me that the person who was once keeping them bound in this prison was now the one that was releasing them, was now the one that they were leading to Jesus Christ. (laughs) You see, God's freedom and fruitfulness in our life serves as a witness to others. And I also prophesy that this year, next week, why not, that there would be people sitting in the chairs next to you that you've been praying for for years the people that you never thought would come to church with you, that they'd be sitting beside you under the word of God, hearing about this hope that we have in Jesus. And so tell someone your story. I just felt on my heart to encourage you briefly. Tell someone your story of Jesus in your life. Maybe you've felt that nudge to tell someone this, um, these past weeks and you've been a little scared. Tell someone your testimony. It has power because it points to the one who has power. Amen? Amen. And so another sign and wonder <laughs> followed this moment as Paul and Silas chose to praise in the prison. And I have faith for this one today. And it's that chains were broken. Chains were broken. You see, everyone's chains came loose. The earthquake (laughs) caused the chains on their hands, the chains that were attached to the walls to wrench loose, and they were set free. See, worship broke the power of their physical chains. But I also believe that worship can break the power of our emotional and our spiritual chains. Do you believe that this morning? That worship can break the power of doubt, of insecurity, of sadness, of feeling overwhelmed. And I believe that as Christians that we are called to be emotionally and spiritually healthy that God cares about our health, that he cares about your heart, that he cares about your mental health. He's calling us to be a church that would be healthy. And one of the ways that you might see chains broken in your life this year is by not just letting the people around you just be people you pass on a Sunday, but that you would gather around a table in fellowship, that you would share together that you would be real, that you would talk about the real things of life, and that as people encourage you, as people pray for you, that you would be healed in community. 
Maybe for you, it's about seeking out some wise counsel this year or seeking out a counselor to talk through the things of life to become emotionally healthy. And in my life, the way I have seen chains broken is when I have paired that counseling with the counsel of God and God can do incredible things and set you free and heal you, amen? And in this process, worship is a beautiful tool from God. It's a tool that he gives us so that we can sense his peace, his power, his presence. And maybe in this room, you're not sleeping too well. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed and you feel like you're in that midnight hour, like Paul and Silas. It might not be a prison, but it could feel like there's a prison in here. I want to encourage you today that worship is a tool that God has given us. And sometimes in my life, in my midnight hour, I have had to get up and begin to praise the name of Jesus and speak out his peace. Because when I am praising him, the enemy cannot get a word in. (laughs) Worship is a tool. When your chains get too heavy and you stop sleeping at night, praise his name. Tell God what that chain is, that failed relationship, that disunity, the diagnosis, the bully at school. He's faithful. He listens to our cries. And I'll get the band to come up as we talk about the last sign and wonder that followed their praise in the prison. Are you still with me this morning? And I also have faith for this today. It's that doors were opened. Doors were open. You see, the prison that they were located in, that area around Philippi, it wasn't uncommon that there were earthquakes in that area. But what's so miraculous about this specific moment and this earthquake is that it came at just the right time as they started to praise the name of Jesus. And it wasn't an earthquake that made the prison collapse It wasn't an earthquake that um, had prisoners, you know, be hurt. It was an earthquake that wrenched open doors and chains. You see, suddenly the prison doors that were once locked by bars flew open. Flew open. Open doors. You know, Paul and I, my husband Paul and I, last year, we were praying for open doors. And open doors is really just a Christianese way of saying opportunity or guidance or clarity. We're praying for that in our lives. We're in a season where we were wondering what God was doing, what he was asking us to do. And so we decided to do a fast together. And uh, what you need to know is like, I appreciate chicken, steak, like, Love it. And so we decided to do the Daniel fast with the lentils, the fruits, the vegetables. And we're like, you know what? We were just desperate. We're, we're just going to seek God right now. We're going to fast. And what was funny is as we were fasting and seeking God, it felt like more doors were closing than opening. And I was like, God, is this you? I Like, this is my sacrifice. I am giving this up. Is this you? The doors are closing. You want me to move where? You want me to do what? And so there was this moment in May of last year and there was this opportunity that came up and it just felt like, oh, maybe this is the open door. This is it. I knew they weren't all closed doors. And I was like, I'm gonna go for it. It was a dream job in ministry with youth. And I was like, oh yes, this is amazing. So I put myself out there and I loved my current job. But I just felt like I'd hit a bit of a ceiling. I felt like I was ready for something new to do what had been on my heart. So I put myself out there and HR gave me the call back and they're like, Sarah, you wanna come in for an interview tomorrow? I was like, yes, I am there, I'm ready, let's go. So I woke up the next morning, I did my hair, I put my power suit on, put my blazer on. (laughs) And I was like, I'm ready to go. I was playing worship music in my car driving down Windsor Road in Sydney. (laughs) And as I was, I was like, you know what? I haven't had an interview in a few years. Uh, What are they gonna ask me? So I was like, you know, I'm playing a bit of role play, like, okay, I'll be the employer and the employee. What are they gonna ask me? I'm gonna rehearse my answers. So as worship was playing in my car, as I'm driving down Windsor Road in Sydney, I was like, yep, all right, these are my answers. I think I got this. 
As, and as I was rehearsing this, I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me. And he was like, what are your three biggest revelations of God? I was like, oh, oh, so simple. That he is good, that he is kind, and that he is faithful. And that was the last thing I thought about before I pulled up into the car park, the parking lot at work that day. <laughs> And I went inside and HR came in and they're like, okay, it's like an hour and 40 until your interview. You ready? This is where you'll meet us. I was like, yep, good to go. Not even 10, 15 minutes later, they came back in and I was like, oh, are you, I'm excited to see you too. But like, I've got to eat my lunch. I'll see you then. And you could just tell by the look on their faces, there was not good news. And they're like, Sarah, we are so sorry. I can't believe this is happening, but we've got a call. And we've had to freeze all the finances for this role. There's a bit of a financial crisis right now. And there's been a meeting happening this morning and we've had to freeze this role. And you know what? Don't put your hope in it. It's probably not coming back around anytime soon. Don't wait on it. I was like, oh. And it just felt like the door slammed shut in my face. An hour and a half before I thought it was gonna open. And so I did the reasonable thing and I went to my car and I cried. <laughs> the same place that I'd found myself an hour and a bit before. And the Holy Spirit reminded me, do you remember what I asked you? Do you remember what I asked you? I was like, oh yeah. What are my three biggest revelations of who God is? That He is good that He is kind, and that He is faithful. And so I'm gonna believe that to be true. And if this door slams shut, then I believe that there is a bolted door somewhere else that He's waiting to open up for me. <laughs> and here I am, <laughs> walking into a harvest, so grateful for God's guidance in my life. And so when you experience disappointment, when you experience grief, the Holy Spirit will draw you back to the character of God and who He is, that He is good, that He is kind, that He is faithful, that He is true. And so what do you do? You take His hand and you walk through it with Him, trusting His character, trusting His goodness, laying down our disappointment, laying down our grief, because He is a God that has way better plans for us than we have for ourselves. And His plans and His purposes will prevail in your life. And so this morning, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. Because we can talk all morning about praise being the soundtrack of our lives, or we could do it. <laughs> and we can take time to enter in and praise Jesus in this place in just a moment. You see, Paul and Silas, when they chose to praise in their lowest moment, they saw people saved, they saw chains broken, and they saw doors open, and I believe the same for your life. And so this morning, if you're comfortable, maybe even if you're uncomfortable, you want to get a bit uncomfortable this morning, would you raise your hands and surrender to Jesus in this place? As we begin to get ready to praise Him, not caring about the person next to us and what they might think, but that this morning we would give passionate praise to our God. If you are carrying grief or burden in this place, that you would lay it down to Him in this moment and trust His character. And so, Father, we thank You that You are a good God. Lord, we want Your praise to be the soundtrack of our lives, that we would be the people of Your praises. Jesus, that we would make much of You in our lives. And so, Father, we pray for people to be saved. We pray for those people in our lives that we are believing for, God, that You would draw hearts towards You. God, we pray for people experiencing chains in their lives, emotional chains. Father, that You are the lifter of our heads. You are our joy. God, would You surround them with counsel, with community. Father, I pray for people believing for open doors in their lives. When it seems like all the doors have shut, when it seems like there is no hope, God, that You are our hope, that You open doors. And so Jesus, this morning we choose to praise You. We choose to set our eyes 
on you in Jesus' name. And so this morning, we're going to speak out the name of Jesus. And I encourage you to do it passionately and praise His name this morning. Amen.